they're looking for here, meat. Okay. <laughs> All right, if it gets confusing, just stop me, okay? I'll After do my best not to, not to make no it worries. confusing. No worries, no uh, worries. We are going live. Uh, welcome to the Washington Outsider. Uh, my name is Yorina Zuckerman. I'm the editor-in-chief. Uh, today we have a very exciting topic. We are discussing the recent revelations about the role of Italy's government in uh, making the attack on the Rome synagogue in 1982 possible and the various circumstances around it and the implications for current events uh, today in Europe and beyond geopolitical issues concerning Italy's potential alliances with Islamists. With us today is uh, Giovanni Giacoloni. Uh, he's a specialist in uh, counterterrorism and Islamism. Uh, he and he works for two centers each time, and he can tell you a little bit more what that actually means. And uh, Center Studi Machiavelli, and we also yeah. have um, he's our main speaker today. And we have a special guest, Dr. Uh, Mitchell Belfer uh, from the Euro Gulf Information Center, who will. Um, uh, give us a little bit about the geopolitical context uh, afterwards. After both uh, speakers are finished, we'll proceed to the question and answer uh, portion um, of this uh, discussion. Uh, Giovanni, the floor is all yours. Good evening and thanks everyone. Um, I thought that um, considering that uh, we have, uh, you know, this very interesting uh, news that came out last week in Italy about um, the October 9th, 1982 terror attack uh, against the Great Synagogue in Rome, I thought that it would be um, the case of um, not only explaining what, what this is about, but uh, making a, a broader uh, giving a broad a broader picture of the uh, of the whole situation because uh, this uh, this single case is just one small piece inside uh, a wider per, uh, a wider perspective that we need to understand. Um, we have uh, we have plenty of information, so I'll try to make this as as clear as possible, and I mean, if there's anything that it's not, it's it's, uh, it's confusing, just stop me and ask. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, here's what happened last week. Um, newspaper Il Reformista uh, indicated, wrote that um, when uh, um, when the, the, the this attack took place, it was October 9th, 1988. Um, the, the target was the Great Synagogue in Rome and uh, a, a group of Palestinian terrorists uh, shot uh, against the people that were celebrating uh, the children's blessing and uh, uh, Bar Mitzvah. And uh, they killed a two-year-old baby, uh, Stefano Gaitache, and they injured 37 others. Um, in, two, in 2008, former president of the Italian Republic, Francesco Cosiga, had released a long interview to Israeli newspaper, Yediot Acharonot. And he basically said, we sold you. What, 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 what did that mean? It meant that basically uh, the Italian government didn't do anything to prevent that attack. Uh, for some reason, that interview just passed unnoticed by uh, most newspapers and the political arena. Uh, now, with the new revelation, it turned out that between uh, uh, June 18, 1982 and October 2nd, so, you know, it's, uh, we're talking about just a few months. The Italian intelligence sent uh, uh, 16 warnings, at least 16 warnings, 
to the Italian government and to the police saying that uh, there was an attack that was about to take place in uh, in the one that uh, uh, was uh, sent let me see on uh, uh, on October 2nd so basically uh, just a couple of days before the attack, they even indicated the synagogue that was supposed to be targeted. On September 25th, they indicated the group that was supposed to perpetrate the attack. Well, not only the, um, the government didn't do anything, but uh, it is, it, it, there is also another issue here. Uh, despite the fact that there was something going on on that specific day, because as we said, there was the children's blessing and the bar mitzvahs, uh, they, they did not place the police patrol outside the synagogue uh, to protect it. And the question is, why wasn't it there? And, you know, um, after over 40 years, it is obvious that uh, the Jewish community in Rome the Italian Jewish community, they want, they want to know why nobody, uh, nobody did anything. I mean, we're talking about 16 warnings between June and early October. That is a lot. And now you know, the, the question is, why wasn't the police there on that specific day? Because you, usually they had a patrol car outside. Uh, station it wasn't there on that on that day and another interesting thing is that one of the um, one of the people that was there um, actually uh, noticed two suspicious individuals they weren't they weren't uh, they didn't look like Arabs here it says they look like uh, northern Europeans uh, which makes sense, and we'll see why later. Um, he, he saw them, and you know they were just standing there, and then they just moved away. And when the uh, Palestinian group came out and they started shooting, they they were totally out of the line of fire, and nobody was ever convicted for that attack. Nobody, and. Um, Eventually, sometime later, um, one of the witnesses was um, was questioned by the police, and they showed him a pictures of uh, German uh, left wing terrorists. And he told the police, he said, "Look, uh, I saw them, but you know the the the, the group that uh, opened fire, they were Arabs." And the police just said, uh, you know, just don't ask any questions. Uh, answer if you know them or not. And like he was showing them uh, profiles that came from the German police. So this is the this is what came out. Okay, sixteen warnings. Nobody moved a finger, and the patrol car wasn't there. And clearly, the question: Why? I mean, here. We're here today to raise a whole set of questions. Okay, we we don't know the answers. We we can only um, come up with uh, uh, with information, and we can try to connect them. But we don't have the answers, and the answers should come from the Italian institutions. Um, when we when we started, I said. Uh, we, we need to understand that this is a piece that needs to be placed inside a wider picture, a broader picture. So what I want to do is uh, take a step back and um, go to the 1970s, uh, when uh, Palestinian terrorism was uh, constantly striking in, uh, in Europe. And um, the, 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 there's, there are two specific cases. And as we will see, um, <clears throat> there will be several elements that uh, will be 
uh, in common with the synagogue case. And please let now, me know if you need uh, if you need hosting rights so you could share materials uh, because then I'll I'll give okay. you the yeah okay I'll yeah, um do yeah we'll we'll um i will share a couple of things uh, uh in, in a while okay um okay let's uh let's put this uh the october 9th 1982 case aside for a second and let's go to september 5th 1973. rome ostia ostia is basically rome's beach it's very close to the airport, to the international airport. Um, five Palestinian terrorists were arrested in an apartment in the proximity of the airport, thanks to an input coming from the Israeli intelligence. And inside the apartment, the police found two Strela-2 surface-to-air missiles ready to be used against an Israeli civil airline. Now, we will call this uh, Strela case one because we will have two cases of such uh, missiles. Now, um, what happened was that um, this five individuals, all Arabs with different passports were uh, immediately arrested. The two rockets were taken uh, it seems that they were supposed to target an El Al flight, um, uh, either arriving or departing from Rome. It is not clear. Some even clear that he, clear, um, claimed that it was supposed to be for Golda Meir, but Golda Meir uh, traveled to Italy in January. So th there, there are, there are some, some details that are not clear. What we do know is that there were five um, Arab terrorists and two uh, Strela missiles. Now, listen to this. Two of these five terrorists were released on bail, transferred to an Italian intelligence flat, and the following day, they were secretly flown to Libya on board an Italian Air Force flight. Uh, among the members of... Uh, the Italian intelligence on the plane to Libya, uh, there was Colonel uh, Stefano Giovannone. Okay, let's keep this main in, name in mind because he will constantly come up in other cases too. So, three are left um, to await trial. Two are transferred, secretly transferred uh, to Libya. And uh, none of them will be convicted, of course. The following day, or two days later, I'm not sure. Um, if it's a matter of a couple of days. The same aircraft with the same crew, not the uh, the four intelligence officers. Okay? okay, I'm talking about the flight, the crew, the pilot, and well, the same exact plane, which was a Douglas C-47 Dakota named Argo-16, used by the secret organization Gladio, with the same crew, crashed near Venice. No one survived. Mm. And who did, who, did they, who did the Italian intelligence chief of the time, General Maletti, blame? The Mossad, of course. Mm. Uh, <laughs> on um, now, on December, on December 17th, the trial against the three remaining terrorists began. And what happened on the same day? Uh, well, there was the notorious terrorist attack at Rome's airport, Fiumicino. Uh, 34 dead and over 15 wounded. Um, a Panam airliner was attacked with phosphorus bombs by a Palestinian group. And then a Lufthansa um, airliner was hijacked. The hijacking ended up in Kuwait and they were all released and later um, turned to the PLO. Now, let's keep, I know that we have different cases, but it's important to make the connections, okay? So tr please try to follow me and if there's something that's not clear, just ask. 
no worries. Um, now, this uh, 1973 um, uh, case, we call it the Strela One case, okay? So we have a, a cell of Palestinian terrorists that are detained in, uh, in Rome with missiles. They are um, arrested. Two of them are exfiltrated to Libya. The other three go to, uh, go to trial on December 17th of the same year. And on the same day, there's a terror attack at Rome airport, okay? Now, let's, uh, let's go forward of a few years to uh, 1979, okay? The night between November 7th and November 8th, 1979. We're still in central Italy, okay? We are in Ortona, which is a port in the Abruzzo region. Um, what happened is that uh, three members of the Italian radical left group, Autonomia Operaia, reached the port of Ortona from Rome. They were members of the Collettivo Policlinico uh, group. Of autonomy of uh, area. Yeah. Uh, they reached the port with a van and a car, uh, two in a van, one in a car, and they're just waiting near the port. This um, this presence uh, is noticed by someone who calls the police. The police arrives and searches them. What was inside the van? <laughs> two Strela rockets. <clears throat> same type as the one uncovered in 1973 in Ostia. So uh, they, in the meantime, there is a, there is a boat that has been uh, waiting at the port. And when they see that there is something going on, um, they hit the road, they leave, they, they hit the sea. <laughs> they, they leave on board that boat uh, was um, an individual, uh, a Syrian um, weapon trafficker known as Nabil Kadura. Uh, the this three uh, out. Oh, by the way, the the boat was a Lebanese boat named Sidon. And um, as investigations uh, went on, it turned out that the boat was supposed to pick up this missiles and carry them probably to uh, um, to the Middle East. Um, hmm. As uh, investigations went on, uh, police discovered that the three uh, Italian left-wing extremists and Kadura had all been in touch with a Palestinian with Jordanian passport living in Bologna, uh, identified as Abu Anzi Saleh. Uh, who had tried to reach Ortona to oversee the transfer of rockets, but um, he was delayed by a car malfunction. He broke two cars, basically. Um, who was Saleh? Well, Abu Anze Saleh was uh, nothing other than the Palestinian Front for Liberation of Palestine's representative in Italy. He had connection to... Um, to the uh, Collectivo Policlinico of Autonomia Operaia. He was directly linked to the PFLP's leader, George Habash. He was connected to Carlos Illich Ramirez Sanchez, the famous uh, um, terrorist, the jackal. Um, and listen to this, he was very close to Colonel Stefano Giovannone, the same intellig Italian intelligence officer who took the two um, terrorists uh, in 1973 over to Libya. Now, Giovannone was a high ranking member of the Italian intelligence and he was station chief for, he was for years station chief of um, Italian military intelligence in Beirut during the civil war years. And he was also uh, Aldo Moro's main man on Middle East issues. Now, Aldo Moro was Minister of Foreign Affairs and then 
um, president of um, uh, um, prime minister of Italy. Um, he was famous for his uh, Lodomoro, which is now known to basically everyone. It was a deal made by Italy and the Palestinians. Italy offered uh, not to go after them if they transited or used Italy as a hub or to try to, to transfer weapons. And in exchange, the Palestinians would not um, perpetrate attacks against Italy uh, and Italian interests. Careful, Italy and Italian interests, not Israel, not the United States. Um, according to different uh, testimonies, and by the way, I suggest that for those who can read Italian, you might want to read this book, which is called Il Patto Tradito, the uh, of uh, uh, it's by Marino Valentini, and uh, um, there's a lot of interesting information in there. Um, so, according to different testimonies, jo jo uh, Colonel Giovannone was personal grantor of Saleh. He dragged him out of trouble on several occasions. When when the police searched Saleh apartment in Bologna. They found a note with Giovannone's Rome residence phone number under the name Dr. Stefano G. Now, if we go farther into the investigations, we will see that, for instance, General Giovanni Romeo, who was at the time a high rank of the D department of uh, the Italian intelligence, and then the director of the first division of the military intelligence, well, he testified that. Abu Anze Saleh had always been considered by the D office as a very dangerous individual. But despite the fact that he had been expelled on many occasions, he always managed to return to Italy. And Romeo was very, very clear about this. He said, this is the case when different structures of the same service mm -hmm. clash because of different interests and objectives. And if you think about it, you know, I mean, this is clear. Giovannone was Aldo Moro's man for the Middle East. There was a verbal agreement. It was a verbal agreement. I mean, even, uh, even Abu Anze Saleh said this many years later in an interview. Uh, there was a verbal agreement between Italy and the Palestinian, uh, and Palestinian terrorism. And if you think about it, you remember how many uh, civil airliners were hijacked? Yeah. You know, Luf Lufthansa, uh, Air France, um, Pan Am, TWA. How many Italian planes were hijacked in those years? Zero. Now, um, going back to the Ortona case uh, at the port, Saleh and the three uh, autonomy of militants were sentenced to five years of prison. And uh, this caused anger uh, and rage among the PFLP and other Palestinian groups. Uh, both the PFLP and Carlos believed that the arrests were the result of an action perpetrated by, listen to this, Per, an action perpetrated by enemy agents within the Italian intelligence. Enemy agents. What does this mean? I think it's, it is more than clear. Um, according to investigations, um, the Italian intelligence tried to influence judges, as reported by Marino Valentini in his book, but without any positive out outcome because the the judges were stubborn about this. And there's also one other thing to consider. It wasn't just a Palestinian. There were three um, extreme left-wing terrorists involved, militants, ter terrorists, whatever you want to call them. And this complicated uh, the whole issue. Um, and uh, again, um, Abu Anze Saleh was very angry. He couldn't Real, he couldn't understand why he was being held and uh, and questioned because you know there was a deal. 
and he even, he even said it in, in, in 2009 in an interview with Arab Monitor. He said it. I can state that there was a deal between Italy and the PFLP. Colonel Stefano Giovannone was the grantor, and it, it was not a written deal, but a verbal deal. And he says the deal was made in the early 1970s, probably after the uh, 1973 terror attack in Fiumicino, but that's, that's just my opinion. Uh, this, this deal was made between Giovannone and a high ranking member of the PFLP, whom I will not mention because he is still today, today, we're talking about 2009, on the public scene. Um, well, on January 25th, 1980, Abu Anze Saleh is sentenced in first degree to five years of prison. On August 2nd, 1980, a bomb blows up inside the waiting room of Bologna train station, causing the death of 85 people and the injury of over 200. Where was Abu, Sa uh, Abu Anze Saleh uh, residing in? Bologna. Where does the bomb blow up? Bologna. The explosion collapsed the roof of the waiting room, uh, destroyed most of the main building, and even hit a nearby train. Several members of the neo fascist terrorist organization, uh, nu Nuclear Armati Revolutionari, it means uh, Armed Revolutionary uh, Nucleus, were sentenced for the bombing, although the group always denied any type of involvement. I mean, I would, the, um, uh, the head of the that group said, I killed a lot of people, but I didn't do that. Um, many years later, new information emerged on international terrorist networks and inter Italian intelligence. Secret agreements with the Palestinian leadership tied to arms and trafficking um, uh, between the PFLP and Italy and a warning to the anti-terrorist secret service three weeks before the massacre were discovered. Uh, as a matter of fact, on July 11th, 1980, the Central Office for General Investigations and Special Operation of this Italian State Police warned Italian intelligence about the very negative reactions of the uh, Palestinian Front for Liberation of Palestine to the incarceration of Saleh and learned from people belonging to the Middle Eastern community in Bologna that something was going on. Now, let's keep in mind that Bologna had a conspicuous Middle Eastern community already at the time. Uh, it is also important to recall that uh, Thomas Cram, who was the uh, member of a German terrorist group, and he was linked to Carlos the Jackal and to the Palestinian, was in Bologna on that specific day. And he was in Verona three months before. According to investigators, Verona had... Um, it was in Verona that the PFLP had a weapon warehouse. Uh, on November 17, 2005, the, uh, a prosecutor in Bologna opened a case against unknown individuals. And uh, uh, according to media reports, in 2004 and 2007, Francesco Cosiga, the former president of the Republic who released that interview to Yediot Acharonot, suggested that uh, there was a Palestinian involvement in that case. Now, let's stop for a minute and look for some common denominator, okay? Uh, first of all, if we take the two uh, Strela cases that we, we've seen, the 1973 and uh, um, the 1979, uh, we will see that, first of all, there is an involvement of Palestinian terrorism. This is the first common element. Second common element, the presence of Strela 2 rockets. You know, in, the, in these years, there were all this Strela Sam traveling through Italy for some reason, okay? Then what do we have? We have trial that are followed by terror attacks. Um, it, it is interesting to notice also that there is a continuous systematic presence presence of Colonel Stefano Giovannone. And listen to this. 
the defendant the defendant lawyer for both cases, so the 1973 and the 1979-80 cases, uh, well, it's the same lawyer. Uh, it's an Italian lawyer who was also working for the Italian embassy in Libya. Hmm? How about that? I'm not finished. <laughs> that, that, that was quite um, that was quite amazing, I have to say. <laughs> it's but, just, uh, I mean, it's nothing. It, it's all public. I mean, I didn't. It's I, I didn't. I didn't make any personal discoveries. It's just. It's just a matter of connecting the dots, really. Well, that's the problem. Is most people don't bother doing that at all and miss important information relevant for other things. By the way, you wanted to share a couple of items. If you need to do that, I can. Yeah, that's there. for the second part. Because okay. now we're in, uh, we're still in the 1970s and the 1980s. Yeah. Then we'll come to the contemporary time, and we'll we'll share that because we'll see that there are weird, there are strange things going on still today. Absolutely. So, what happened? Um, some journalists have linked this Strela II case, the Ortona case, to the disappearance in Beirut of two Italian journalists uh, that same year, 1980. It was a summer, we have the on early August, of a second we have the terror attack in Bologna. At the end of August, Garciella de Palo and Italo Toni, who are working at the time, I think for Paese Sera, traveled to Beirut, to Damascus and then to Beirut. Um, de Palo, in particular, she had, she was, uh, a very smart uh, uh, journalist who uh, who had been um, uh, working on weapon trafficking business between Italy and the Middle East. And she also had an interest on Colonel Giovannone. And she had begun to investigate the Bologna terror attack. On uh, August 24th, uh, that same month, uh, they reached Lebanon on a trip that was organized by PLO representative in uh, in Italy, uh, Namer Hamad, and they're hosted uh, by the PLO at the Triumph Hotel in Beirut. Now their goal, their objective, was to visit Palestinian refugee camps in uh, um, in the south of uh, Lebanon and a PLO base in Beaufort. Uh, according to reports, they were supposed to be picked up. By in the morning, by a jeep of the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. The previous day, to the uh, they were already in Beirut. They were waiting for the following day to to go to South Lebanon. So uh, they decided to go to the Italian embassy in Beirut and communicate their trip. They said, "Look, we're going to you know with the this um, the FLP." Um, uh, car to the south of Lebanon. We want to visit, you know, the base and the refugee camps. Eh? And if we don't come back in three days, you know, then start searching, start looking for us. On the on the following morning, someone did pick them up, but it was not the DFLP jeep because the two vanished and they were never found. Now, according to investigations, the Italian embassy did not activate until the end of September. I mean, the end of September. And guess who was in charge of the investigation? Colonel Giovannone. Not him Staying. again. <laughs> it's always him. I mean, he's always there. <laughs> and he immediately tried to exonerate the PLO from any responsibility, and he tried to blame the Christian phalangists, the Myronites. Um, according to... Uh, Marino Valentini, uh, in his book, he writes that someone within the Italian uh, intelligence sector had rumored to the Palestinians that, were, that, that the two journalists were in Lebanon to conduct uh, espionage activities against the, the Palestinians. Um, I don't have any uh, official documentation to back that up, but that's an interesting element. In any case, it is quite evident that the Italian intelligence tried to try a major cover-up. Then, 
In 1982, um, Deputy Prosecutor Giancarlo Armati um, initiated a serious investigation um, and uh, he established that the two journalists were apprehended at the hotel by a trip driven by militants of the PFLP, by the Popular Front Liberation of Palestine, George Habash, the mm -hmm. one that, uh, you know, the, the, the group that Abuanza Saleh belonged to. Um, the prosecutor asked for the arrest of Habash, who was later who was later acquitted, in all levels of trial due to insufficient evidence, and he also asked for the indictment indictment of uh, General Santovito, who was at the time director of uh, Italian military intelligence, and of Colonel Stefano Giovannone. Uh, um, however. Um, in the uh, summer of 1984, uh, the, um, the, the Italian government placed a state, sec uh, state state's uh, secret on the case, and uh, everything basically, uh, it was all silenced. In the meantime, both Giovannone and Santo Vito died, and the state, state secret status on the case hasn't been lifted yet. So, uh, if we start, um, you know, if we start to put all the, you know, connect all the dots, I mean, we take the, uh, the um, uh, 19, uh, October 9th, 1982 terror attack against the synagogue in Rome when, you know, despite the 16 warnings in four months, nobody moved a finger. Uh, and we take these two cases, three cases, the, uh, the two St uh, Strela missiles cases and the uh, uh, disappearance of the two Italian journalists in Lebanon, you know, it's, uh, the, the, you know, the thing becomes thick. And let me just remind you one last thing. I won't get into details, but in October 1985, when the Italian uh, cruise ship Achille Laura was hijacked, uh, you remember the, the case? Okay. We, well, what happened? Uh, at some point, um, the terrorists, including its leader, Abu Abbas, they were being um, uh, transferred with an, uh, with an Egyptian, yes, an Egyptian airliner. Uh, if I think it was in Tunisia, from Egypt to Tunisia, the plane was um, uh, was let's say hijacked. Uh, it was the route was diverted by by the U.S. Air Force to the NATO base in Sigonella, Cis Sicily. Well, <laughs> what happened? It's th this was I mean uh, it, it's probably one of the most ridiculous situations uh, I have have seen. Um, the Italians, based, uh, well, the Americans um, uh, moved in with the uh, uh, with special forces because they wanted Abu Abbas. Let's not forget that Abu Abbas and his terrorists murdered uh, an uh, an American an American Jew on board that that ship, uh, he was on a wheelchair. They shot him and they threw him at sea. So America had all the rights to ask for, uh, uh, for, for them to be handed over. Well, guess what? The, uh, the Italians surrounded, well, the, the Americans surrounded the plane, the Egyptian plane. The Italians surrounded the Americans uh, uh, and uh, basically, they they said no because it's against international law. He has to be tried in Italy because they, they, the ship was Italian. Yeah, but <laughs> they murdered an American citizen, and and they basically, uh, they, 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 in my opinion, they protected they protected uh, Abu Abbas, and now you know. Everyone can make their own assumption, connect the dots, and they can get an idea on, on what happened, what was going on 
in those years. And <clears throat> this is why I was saying that, you know, the 1982 attack in Rome against the Great Synagogue is just one small piece of the puzzle. And um, now, um, I don't know if you have any questions, because then I want to make a small uh, short bridge and uh, pass on to the contemporary events that are worth Oh, 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 questions are weak for later, so please proceed. Okay. To everything you okay. So, what I would, well, first of all, uh, I think that it's a must to uh, cite the, the a book in Italian. Uh, I hope it will be translated in, into English because it's amazing by Francesca Musacchio, a friend of mine who wrote uh, um, in Italian, it's called uh, La Trattoria. Uh, Stato Islam. It's uh, the uh, state Islam nego negotiation, where she basically explains how um, there are some uh, some things that uh, should be um, should be pondered. Um, she, she 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 even she 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 clearly say, stated it in an interview. She says that there are a lot of inconsistency, inconsistencies and contradictions in Italian politics when it gets to face. Uh, now she's talking about Islamist terrorism, okay? She's basically saying, okay, we know that in the 1970s, we had a deal between Italy and Palestinian terrorism. And she says there are still strange things going on in Italy when it gets to Islamist terrorism. Um, it's 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 clear that there are strange. I mean, in Italy we have a lot of um, unofficial clandestine mosques. They're not even mosques; they're Islamic uh, prayer rooms. Uh, that are being tolerated because uh, uh, there are only like three, four mosques in Italy that are allowed so far. It's a very complicated issue related to the fact that there is uh, the, the, the Muslim community is divided. So, you know, th through throughout the years, we started having all this warehouses that became musallat or prayer rooms, and in many of them, uh, they preach uh, uh, radical uh, Islamism. And, and Francesca Musacchio says a lot of people uh, are asking why, you know, uh, there have been terror attacks all over Europe, Germany, Spain, France, the UK, Belgium, and not in Italy. And I mean, I, I was asked the same question by European and uh, American colleagues on many occasions, and I don't have an answer. I can only make some assumptions, and that's what um, you know. I want to try to do today, uh, or at least expose a few um, strange. Mm, elements, cases that are worth pondering on. I mean, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not accusing, indeed, I'm not accusing Italy of uh, making any deal with the jihadists, but I am raising questions about what's going on because I heard, um, I heard several explanations for this. The first one is, oh, but Italy has a very, the Italian, uh, security has a long experience because of the 1970s um, against, uh, you know, the during the left wing and right wing, extreme left and extreme right uh, terror years. Okay, um, I am not going to agree with that because, first of all, uh, other countries had, sent this, had the same issues. I mean, the Germans had it with the uh, uh, you know, the Red Army Group and the Bader Meinhof. Uh, France had its own issues. The UK, I mean, uh, we all remember the IRA. Uh, mm -hmm. So what are we talking about? And even Spain had it with ETA 
-hmm. So it's it's not an Italian priority. And um, uh, some even said that ah, because uh, you know they they have experience with mafia, but mafia is something else. It's organized crime. It's uh, even former Interior Minister Mini Marco Miniti said they're two different things. Uh, so that doesn't make sense. Other said because it's a bridge, so you know it's 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 used as a bridge between the Muslim world and Europe, so they they don't attack where the, 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 you know the areas where they go through. But that doesn't make sense either because Spain is uh, is another bridge. I mean, uh, how, how many Al Qaeda, you know, the September 11th uh, terrorists they 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 they, they used Spain, so that doesn't make sense. Uh, because Spain was hit in Madrid, it was hit in Barcelona, so that doesn't make sense either to me. Um, now, um, there is, I think that there is one specific case that is worth mentioning uh, in relation to this, and that is the uh, Anis Amri case, which uh, he, he is the, in Italy, he's known as the Christmas market, market uh, attacker. He mm -hmm. attacked a, a Christmas market in Berlin on December 19, 2016. As we will see, there are a lot of strange things here going on. Okay. what uh, I'm not going to um, get into details on the attack. I can... Um, or on... Uh, how he um, he went through France after the attack. I want to focus on the uh, his Italian um, tr um, transit because, as as you might remember, uh, Anis Hamri uh, attacked uh, the Berlin market and then he fled by bus and train to France and then he reached Italy immediately right after the attack. The first thing he did is. Take a bus, take a train, go to Italy. And apparently he didn't worry about being detected. I don't know. Uh, fact is that he was shot dead in uh, Sesto San Giovanni, which is basically the outskirts, the northern outskirts of Milan, by two police officers. Uh, as we will see, no, let me just get the, here it is. Um, what, uh, here's here's what happened on uh, uh, on his way back. He uh, from he reaches uh, uh, Lyon, if I recall correctly, and then from Lyon he takes a, uh, a train to Torino. From Turin he reaches Milan at eight uh, at um, midnight fifty eight. Okay, uh, on the uh, between uh, the nineteenth and twentieth of December two thousand sixteen. He, he is um, he's caught by CCTV in the uh, in Central train station uh, at 1 a.m. Then from the Central train station, he walks to Piazza Argentina, which is less than uh, it's less than one kilometer away by foot. He gets there at 215. So uh, it, it took him. Uh, approximately an hour to get there. Why? Nobody knows. At 2.40 a.m., he boards a bus uh, in order to reach the Sesto San Giovanni train station. Now the question is why? I mean, Milan's train station has all sort of connections. Bus, train, can go anywhere. Why go, why go all the way up in the northern hoods to Sesto San Giovanni, which is, it's basically, it's a sleeping, uh, it's a sleeping city, you know, where people sleep there and then they go to work uh, to Milan. So why? It doesn't make any sense. And he didn't have any problems. He just walked around without any problems. He didn't, he was, I mean, just a few hours late, uh, earlier, you know, he, he perpetrated an attack attack in Berlin and now he's just walking in the middle of the night not even you know during the day there are a lot of people around but in the middle of the night and that's I know Milan pretty well that's not an area where you want to walk on your own because 
you know, the part that connects uh, Piazza Argentina to Stazione Centrale, it's quite unsavory. What happens? He reaches the, um, the, the train station in Sesto San Giovanni. He tries to get inside, but it's closed because they shut it at night. And at that point, he is noticed by a patrol car. Uh, they notice him as suspicious, so they try to stop him. They actually do stop him. He pulls out a gun, and they exchange fire, and Amr is killed. And that's quite strange. Um, now, uh, another very strange thing is that immediately after uh, the exchange of fire, the names of the two officers that shot him are, po are, are posted online by the Italian government. And the Ministry of Interior Affairs, Mengiti, goes on press conference and makes their names again. And everyone was like, what the hell is he doing? I mean, you don't do that. You don't do that. You don't say names and last name of someone who just sh shot a major terrorist. Uh, and and the, 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 I mean, I, I have right here, the, because they told him, they said, you know, what are you doing? I mean, um, let me find it. Uh, yeah, he said that, he basically said that, well, you know, because uh, at the time we didn't know that he was Ani Samri. So, uh, you know, by the time uh, the shooting took place, uh, one of the two agents was wounded. And uh, so we, we decided, uh, you, you know, the maid had already been made. Yeah, but you know, there, there's a terrorist on Milan. You know that, he might very, very well be transiting anywhere in Europe. It's not exact. I mean, shootings in Milan are not that common, street shootings. Okay. So you, you know that just a few hours before there was a terror attack in, uh, in Berlin, you know that there's a shooting, you might as well want to wait, you know? And, <laughs> and, and then he also said, no, but we don't, we're not, we don't have to show that we're scared of terrorists. You know, we know. Um, we, we're, we're not afraid. Yeah, but in the meantime, they had to put patrol uh, cars outside the 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 house, the the homes of the two police agents because you know obviously there there was a risk. And this is this is a very very strange thing. And let me just add one last thing. I have no explanation to the thing that I'm about to show you, but it's worth uh, watching. Now, how, how can I upload a file? Let me do give you hosting rights and then you'll be able to share your screen. All right. Uh, one second, Wait, host. Okay, now you can share a screen and upload it to there. If you look at the line of items at the bottom of your screen. Okay, hang on, at the, at the bottom, right? Yes. Uh, 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 share screen. Yes. Okay, hang on, let me let me take the, the file out. Oh, here it is. Okay. Let's see if it works. I've never done bef this before. Um, share screen. Okay, can you see it? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, uh, you see the red star? Yes. Okay, that's Sesto San Giovanni's uh, train station where Amri was shot by the police. You see the blue star? Yes. Okay. Well, Amri um, attacked in Berlin on board a truck, right? Well, that truck had departed from a company that 
uh, is based right there. Basically, the truck that was driven by a Polish driver departed on December 16th from that specific location. He drove all the way to Germany, to Berlin. Then at some point, according to reconstruction, Amri boarded that truck in Germany. Uh, it seems uh, that um, he attacked, uh, he hijacked the truck on the afternoon of the December 19th, so on the same day of the attack, shot the driver, perpetrated the attack, and then went all the way back to Milan and uh, to Sesto San Giovanni, uh, less than a mile from where that truck had departed. Now, I'll have to call this a coincidence because I don't have any um, uh, any element to say that there is something more than a coincidence. But this is a very strange coincidence, in my opinion. Now, how how do I go back to okay, stop share? All right, and uh, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Okay. This Amri case still has a lot of big question marks. Later in, um, in March 2018, a network related to Anis Amri uh, was taken down in Lazio, near Rome, mainly Latina and Aprilia. Uh, 20 individuals ended up under investigation, which means that Amri had an extensive network on Italian soil. Uh, investigators themselves, after you know, what, 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 there were there were a lot of questions to be answered, and they said, "Why was he in Milan?" And they said, "Probably they uh, Amra either wanted to reach uh, the south of Italy, Calabria." When the police stopped stopped him, he said, "I'm from Calabria." Yeah. They didn't believe him, of course, or maybe in central Italy, in Rome, where he had, uh, or I don't know, in some other area in central Italy where he had connection. Uh, indeed, Amri is not the first uh, uh, terrorist who reaches Italy. Uh, and uh, um, uh, perpetrates attacks in, uh, in Europe. Anis Amri had reached uh, uh, Italy illegally in 2011 like many other terrorists, you know, they used to say, no, terrorists don't reach Italy through boats. That's not true. <laughs> I mean, evidence shows the exact opposite. They said Amri radicalized in Germany. That's not true. There are plenty of, uh, there's plenty of material proving that Anis Amri radicalized in jail in Sicily. And he... He cheered for other terror attacks. Uh, he um, attacked another inmate, a uh, Christian inmate, uh, said, uh, saying, I will cut your head off. He was even indicated by police uh, as the leader of a group of Islamists um, detainees. Um, he, he clearly radicalized in while well, in custody in Sicily, he was uh, he perpetrated several uh, episodes of violence inside uh, the penitentiaries, and uh, then at some point he was released and he just vanished in Germany. Uh, Germany didn't manage to um, expel him because Tunisian authorities uh, did not cooperate and that is quite frequent um, so he was being tolerated in Germany but the Germans knew very well who he was and and if we want to add some more we can say that the Nice attacker also a Tunisian Brahim Aisawi who um, who killed uh, uh, three people in uh, uh, in October 29th 2020, he beheaded, he beheaded one of them, an elderly woman. 
he had also arrived in Italy on board a boat. He was uh, uh, placed uh, on a, I think it was called Rhapsody. On, uh, he was placed on this quarantine uh, ship called, boat called Rhapsody uh, and because of COVID and transferred to the port of Vare. Uh, where he was identified by Italian authorities and given a notice informing him of his expulsion from Italy for illegal entry, which basically means we give you this paper and you just have to leave voluntarily. And, you know, that, 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 like that's really going to work. At this point, the uh, Mr. Awusawi, who had already been radicalized in Tunisia, and we have evidence of this. We wrote about this on the Italian Team for Security and Terroristic Issues um, website. Um, he was released and for a month he he was in, in Sicily and then he just took a train to Rome and then to Nice where he perpetrated the attack. Um, this is Another interesting case that might be worth um, some uh, um, some further questions, and and then there is a political issue as well because um, well it's not it's not just political. Um, um, you might remember uh, in October two thousand and nine, the Times. Um, uh, by the way, I'm just um, showing some cases of strangeness going on. Okay, so mm -hmm. I, I I showed you the Amri case. I showed you the I showed you the Awisawi case. These are just two. There are others, but you know it would take too much time to <clears throat> go through them all, uh, and also probably the most significant. Um, you might remember that in October 2009. The, the Times uh, came out with an article that enraged the Italian government, saying that Italian soldiers in Afghanistan paid bribes to the Taliban in order not to be attacked. Uh, and this um, this became a problem with France because in 2008, 10 French soldiers were killed and 21 injured uh, in a region that they believed relatively peaceful. Um, because uh, the Italian, uh, according to what the Times said, the Italian intelligence service had been paying local insurgents to hold off um, and basically not to be attacked. And um, the, the Italian military had uh, showed off to the media as a successful example of hearts and minds operation. Well, according to the Times, they were paying the Taliban not to be Taliban not to be attacked. They didn't tell the French when the French took over, they, they were attacked. And now, uh, clearly, um, I think that the Italian government even uh, started legal action against the Times. I don't know. Uh, I don't know the outcome, but uh, Fran France um, said, well, we cannot prove this. We don't know. The U.S. Embassy made no comment on that, but this clearly was an additional embarrassment uh, for a country that has already been indicated on many occasions you know, as suspicious due to, you know, the fact that there were no attacks, the fact that, you know, all the terror, not all, but many terrorists who strike in Europe go through Italy, the fact that Italy has seen a lot of terror cells and networks on its soil throughout the years. Uh, indeed, we have a history of, you know, deals made with terrorism, with Middle Eastern terrorism, as we've seen before. And we also have uh, political infiltration. Um, because we have seen, and you know this very well too, um, how, um, for instance, the Muslim Brotherhood political Islam has attempted to uh, systematically infiltrate uh, Italian politics 
um, we have seen, for instance, um, in um, in 2000 and uh, uh, well, the, I think it was 2017, um, Marion Ismail, who uh, is uh, um, uh, she's a Somali Muslim. She is uh, the sister of uh, an ambassador that was killed by Islamist terrorists, and she's very active against radicalization in Italy. She and uh, Matteo Forte, uh, they presented a report denouncing uh, links between the Muslim political Islam, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which is uh, considered classified as a terrorist organization in many countries between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Partito Democratico, the Italian PD. And they had, the PD pressed, uh, you know, the, um, took legal action. And in April, 2018, uh, Marian Ismail won because uh, the, the, the court said, there are elements, I have it right here. There are elements that um, connect the individuals belonging to political Islam uh, that, are related to PD and the Muslim Brotherhood. So, I mean, this is this is court. This is a court sentence. But it is not just the PD because I will, as we will see, uh, Lega did the exact same same thing with Salvini. I mean, if we uh, if we think about Salvini, he used to um, attack Qatar, uh, saying that. Uh, you know, Qatar is uh, uh, financing and supporting terrorism. We need severe checks on money coming from Doha because they want to finance uh, Islamist uh, um, Islamic centers. Uh, well, there is even a book about this. I mean, it's not, uh, you know, Qatar paper. Then, I mean, Salvini used to say this when he was in opposition to the government. When he took power as Minister of Interior, he, he immediately changed his mind. He flew to Qatar to sign a series of deals, including military cooperation. Uh, he was at the uh, Dam, uh, DIMDX uh, in Qatar, the, um, uh, the defense uh, fair in Qatar. Um, in July 2019, Salvini uh, was Minister of Interior. Okay, He was not Minister of Foreign Affairs, but he received in Milan Fayez Al Saraj because um, Al Saraj needed help in Libya uh, because of the uh, the clashes that were going on. And as you as you probably know, Italy basically sided with uh, the Islamist side with Tripoli with Al Saraj. It's it is known they provide Italy provided together with Turkey and Qatar. They provided. Uh, intelligence support, um, and Salvini received Paul Saraj in Milan. Again, Salvini was the Minister of Interior. So in my opinion, Al Saraj was supposed to be received by the Minister of Foreign Affairs eventually. Why did he go and see Salvini? Maybe because, uh, you know, Qatar asked for it. I'm asking a question here. Uh, fact is that, you know, it's, it's 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 a, it's a very complicated issue, and I'm 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 on the way to uh, to the end. Uh, it's a very complicated thing because it's not it's not that Italy is you know uh, uh, is a country that is in favor of terrorists, but there is a problem inside Italy with specific political and even in the intelligence community, uh, specific sectors that uh, tend to um, hook up with, uh, with these groups. Um, and you know, I mean, uh, remember before um, when we were discussing 1970s cases, uh, uh, the Italian intelligence officer said there are different sectors within the intelligence and security uh, sector that clash. Mm -hmm. So part of the Italian intelligence might be against, you know, um, they might be against um, 
deals with the Islamists or the Muslim Brotherhood, while others might come up and say, no, uh, why? Uh, we, need, we need them. Uh, we, should, uh, uh, we should talk to them. We should uh, uh, empower them. Uh, they're, they're extremists. They might be extremists, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're terrorists. Um, things like that. And, uh, but, but that is a problem because it's contradicting. It's, uh, it's foggy and it, it truly doesn't help uh, if we want to take serious steps um, you know, against, uh, um, against terror, against Middle Eastern terrorism. And, and I'm not saying that other countries didn't do that because I was just reading an article uh, dated 2019 where it says, by Ifolio, where it says that France did the same thing in 1981 with the Abu Abbas group, I think it was, or Abu, no, Abu Nidal. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, that it's okay. Uh, it's, it's not okay. And uh, that's, that's I, it. Oh, this is, you know, they, you just raised a whole host of issues and I will, I, I will definitely have tons of questions and comments regarding all of this, but I just wanted to give the floor quickly to Dr. Belfer because he is going to have to run. Sure. So uh, thank you very much. Also, I want to uh, apologize for not going video. I forgot my the lead to my computer and my battery is desperately low. Uh, but nonetheless, can, you can hear me okay, I suppose. Yes, yes, yeah, okay. the sound is very good. Um, so, I, I mean, typically it would be uh, perhaps wrong, wrong of me to also go into, because you, you've, got, you've covered a lot of grounds, very specifically to the Italian framework. Uh, I would take a step outside of Italy, uh, talk just very briefly, because I think it's, it's pretty important. For me, I don't look necessarily at... Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say Muslim Brotherhood or even is, Islam related to um, radicalization, but rather to look at something quite broad, um, which is the fact that terrorism related to the Middle East is broken down into two main categories. Uh, the first one is those actions that are essentially state-driven. So countries from parts of the world that are using and utilizing um, terrorist organizations as well as asymmetric groups, guerrillas, uh, and other types of fighters for their kind of foreign, foreign policy and security ambitions. And then the second group, which I'll talk about briefly, are the non-state actors. Very often we can get confused and we talk about lone wolves uh, or we talk about you know, self-radicalized individuals. I don't really believe that this is something that, that takes place. Um, usually there's a framework, a political framework, uh, and that framework has goals, uh, or rather the, the political ambitions of, of those, uh, uh, whether they're non-state or state actors, they have goals, and we have to look at the goal orientation of what these different groups are, are seeking to achieve. So the first one I would like to talk about are the, the larger, the state-driven um, uh, the, the state driven actors. I, we call these the, pin twi the twin peaks actually of global terrorism today. Um, usually we used to refer to it in, in the context of Shia or Sunni. Uh, I don't think that's appropriate anymore. I think that those, those kind of labels are pretty um, false. Instead, we look at it as those countries that are quite comfortable in using uh, terrorism as a tool to advance their ambitions. And those uh, other groups and non-state actors that are uh, using those same tactics for their ambitions. But the question is, what are the ambitions? So if you, uh, if you look at what the, um, if we started with the large state-driven or even proto-state-driven uh, ambitions are, first and foremost, we look at something called the big world network. So very often you'll see them, they use, or their justification are things that happen long and far away from the actual source of uh, uh, the focus of their attention. So very often you hear of the Israel-Palestine conflict, for instance, or the American invasion of Iraq, all of a sudden that's justifying you know, political violence in Libya, or it justifies political violence in, in the Sahel region. 
Of course, these are large and gross exaggerations. I don't think there's ever been a Libyan that's uh, stood in, uh, you know, in defense of Palestine. Um, but these are these are actions that are utilized as a way to justify their behavior. So they take a world issue and they transform it into a, a form of legitimation. Um, it also it's very interesting because here states will use these asymmetrical groups to advance very different sets of uh, interests. Very often, this is based on uh, deterrence or coercion. It's about equalizing a playing field. Uh, so, for example, if a group uh, if, if a group is, is sponsoring, a ter- let's say, a terrorist organization here in Europe, um, we, we, of course, know of Hezbollah. Um, Hezbollah recently got banned out of Germany in both its uh, political and its military wings. There's a reason for that, and it's because Hezbollah was operating on behalf of a state actor uh, and was threatening, therefore, you know, c- citizens of Germany as well as visitors to Germany uh, in pursuit of interests that are, like I said, world's global interests. Uh, and those are the global interests of, of its incubator. Um, but what's more interesting, I think, about groups that are state-driven is that they can also be combated in a different way. So you can put not only economic sanctions, but you can actually put um, a, a kind of military deterrence and co- coercion capability to use, uh, and they will change their behavior in relation to those groups. They will redeploy them out, or you can punish them also through the judicial system. Um, so there's there's a way that you can actually pressure those groups. So they're not as fluid and they're not as flexible as some of the other groups, those that are non-state driven. And that's essentially what I'd like to spend the, the, the little bit of time that I have uh, on, on this, because the, the larger groups, the state driven groups, they are very rigid in their structures. Uh, there's a clear hierarchy, there's a leader and there's a follower, there's, an, there's a, somebody who gives the order and then there's the executioner who fulfills it. When it comes to the non-states, you're talking about something called small world networks. Uh, small world networks are, and, and this is, I think, something very interesting um, to complement what Giovanni had been saying about radicalization, for example, in, uh, in prisons, because here you have something which is called a halakha system. Uh, The halakha is essentially a study group in Arabic, um, but it's only through the generation of these study groups and very small organizations that basically have no contact with each other that allows them to be so fluid. Uh, Radicalization takes place within those groups, um, and usually you can find the person who does the the radicalization and those who are susceptible to it. So messaging is very important. Um, you'll find it's very much like street gangs where you don't have very much flexibility in your social life. So if you belong to a halakha, you that's your morning. Somebody from that group will pick you up, take you to school. You'll hang out with them in school uh, or hang out with them in your job. Um, during lunch, you'll spend with that group. And after in the evening, you go study or do whatever it is that you do uh, with that same small group of people. So your eyes um, are never really leaving that small kind of sub-community group. Now, what's interesting here is that these are what develops the cells, the clusters, and only through there do you get your hubs or your nodes. Now, these guys are very fluid, and radicalization, that's why radicalization takes place in prisons, uh, where you've got these, sub, these sub-state communities. It's why it takes place in schools. It's why it takes place mostly among the youth. Most radicalized individuals are young. They're not old, because as you're older, uh, you're, you're not as susceptible, you're more cynical. You don't necessarily believe that much. Even if you're religious or you're not religious, you don't really believe in people anymore because you don't believe in people anymore. It's very hard for the messages to be received. So you find that radicalization, and these are two very important features of radicalization. Radicalization tends to take place amongst younger people um, and it tends, the, the radicalization process starts at a period of you become a kind of uh, extremist radical and then in a very short period of time that radicalization can be utilized for extremist violence and this is something this is like this jump from being an extremist to being somebody who's comfortable with violence that is the point of contention uh, or the point of focus when you're dealing with counter-terrorism operations Um, that's essentially you know the the small window of opportunity that you have uh, to be able to identify when somebody's radicalization is taking them to the point of being uh, violent. 
Um, I also want to say that the period that we live in now, I always, I hate talking about COVID, uh, but we can't stop talking about COVID. COVID has been one of the most important periods for the radicalization process across Europe. Um, I know uh, when you look at the statistics, most of the terrorist attacks that took place in Europe were prior to, prior to uh, the COVID outbreak. Um, the reason for that, of course, is that during the, before the end of the, the so-called Islamic State, before the, the end of Daesh, um, you had kind of military style operations taking place by members of uh, the Islamic State, as well as members of Al-Qaeda, typically either Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb or Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. They were the ones who were primarily taking actions military style action, paramilitary actions across Europe. Um, in 2014, Adnani, Al-Adnani from the Islamic State basically told Islamic State fighters not to come to Syria and Iraq any longer uh, because he had already seen the writing on the wall. The Islamic State was gonna be defeated and they wanted to wait for Islamic State 2.0. And the Islamic State 2.0, um, this mixture of Al-Qaeda, ISIS kind of blending together to develop these clandestine networks across Europe, we're now in a lull. Um, so there are not that many activities taking place, but we should not breathe fresh air because actually on the horizon is another wave of this type of extremism um, because these guys have basically gone underground. Um, the COVID situation has made things much worse because now they're, you must have heard it. I mean, they for recruitment, this is perfect because they look at, in some of these discourses, they say that this is punishment from God. Um, and when you use and you see this kind of like global flux, you see economies crashing, you see people like coming in and distrust permeating throughout our societies. So it makes it easier for them to also build these, these kind of sub-state or parallel state enterprises, parallel communities um, that they're able to recruit more frequently. So the writing on the wall, from my point of view, is that actually we're, we're witnessing the so-called calm before the storm. Rain has already fallen on us. Now we're in the eye, we're in kind of like just the beginning of this, this wider storm, which is what makes understanding where and how these ideologies of uh, uh, the, these very radicalized ideologies, how they've come to be fermented within our societies, um, and the fact that our law enforcement is always very reactive and not very progressive or proactive. The reason for that as well, of, of course, it's very important to highlight the concept of, of dirty hands theory, where essentially nothing our states can do will be right. Um, if you take too much preemptive action, it's, it's going to violate civil liberties. But if you don't take any, you know, people die because terrorist bombs go off. Um, and so, you know, in these kind of circumstances, our governments need to rethink entirely their geostrategic uh, relationships to try to assist other countries in their struggle against terrorism. Um, because if we don't, we only receive the residual impact of it. Um, there's something to be said there. Radicalization takes place across Europe, but it also takes place around the world. And there are those countries that are facing a very, a very uh, intense battle against such extremist violence, and they need help. That's the bottom line. We can't just on, out of one side of our mouth criticize them for dealing with you know, terrorists the way that they know how in their countries um, while trying to deal with the residual impact of terrorism in our country. We have to work together on these things. And so the first and, for, and foremost, the most important thing to do is find out which countries and which uh, various agencies around the world can complement the efforts that we're engaged in so that we don't end up reinventing the wheel, but also realize that we're all essentially fighting for the same thing, which is a, a self-perseverance uh, pre, self against what is a, a, a very important, very potent, um, but still a very clandestine challenge that we face. Um, the, the, for, from my point of view, just as my last point, um, when you talk about non-state actors and you talk about these uh, clandestine Halakha networks, um, it, by the way, it's not to say that all Halakha are, are like this, but they, these kind of groups, they use the, the, the study group as a cell. And so they even hijack you know, these kind of aspects of Islam. 
Um, but for me, this is the most, the more dangerous. Um, and that's why keeping an eye on Muslim Brotherhood backed groups is so fundamentally important. Because if you don't, if you don't know who they are, um, you can get the level of radicalization that produces Al Qaeda and ISIS. And I know that there are certainly some groups that do not preach that kind of violence, but there are those groups that do. And if you look at the United Kingdom and you look at the birth of uh, Hizbah Tahrir, um, you know, this is, this is essentially a Muslim Brotherhood group gone wrong. Or if you look at the ICE, the Islamic Center of England, it's another, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's become this like hub, this heartbeat of this kind of radicalization. So it's very important to see the, the clandestine groups um, and those that are, you know, based on cell and based on this kind of networking, um, these are far more dangerous because they're much more difficult to trace and much more difficult to deter. And, you know, unless, uh, unless you're willing to really violate the very essence of what our societies stand on, we have to take a, a very different, adopt a very different approach, or we'll be going back to the future, uh, so to speak. So I, I, I don't have nearly as much depth um, to my brief remarks as you did, uh, Giovanni, um, but I unfortunately will have to, to leave it at that. I definitely look forward to going over in more detail some of the, the larger trends in geopolitics, but I will leave us maybe on the point that um, if, you, if you're trying, if you're, if you're looking at the future of these organizations, maybe we shouldn't. Um, my, my interest isn't those organizations, in fact. My interest is us. Um, my interest is in preserving uh, our societies. It's about preserving human life. Um, and it's about doing so in a way that utilizes the power we have, because we have much more power over cyberspace, we have much more military power, we have much more policing power, and our societies are resilient, much more so than these communities. The problem is that we don't know how to use our skills, we don't know how to use our power. And that's far more frightening to me than any kind of group that will sneak up over the years to come. And so rather than focusing on groups, we have to focus on response. And I will leave us on that. And hopefully, Irina, we can do another session later on about responses uh, rather than the groups themselves. I love that idea. I, I, I look forward to hosting that in the in the next few weeks to, uh, to come. And, and I hope the two of you also uh, can pick up the discussion as well, because I see a great deal of complementary kind of um, knowledge base here that needs to be explored further. Though, you know, those guys are working together, so should we. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Belfer, for your remarks. Um, I'll share the full link with the remainder of the discussion with you afterwards. Shifting back to Giovanni, I think Dr. Belfer's broader remarks give excellent focus to some of the issues that you've raised. I kind of want to go back to that, but before I get into that, uh, broader discussion. I wanted to, you know, ask a question that I think uh, has been on the mind of many throughout uh, this whole conversation, which is what happened to that <laughs> uh, ubiquitous intelligence officer, Stefano? <laughs> is there any record of him past those events? I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, do you know what happened to that intelligence officer who was uh, who uh, who was so active in the 70s and 80s and... Uh, Giovannone? Uh, yeah. Oh, he died. Um, when uh, they, they were actually uh, under under trial um, because of the um, disappearance of the two journalists in Lebanon. But in the meantime, him and uh, Santo Vito, they, they both they both died. So they there, there, there was there was nothing that could be done. Ah, that's a shame. And they left no records of their uh, of their activities or involvement. There is in that specific case, there still is a state secret status. Um, they uh, when in the, with the, in the previous government, when Giuseppe Conte was uh, prime minister, they uh, they had asked to lift the status, uh, but mm -mm, they didn't. So it's still under a state secret status and probably for a reason. Mm. So this leads me to believe what you just said, that there seems to be a sort of continuity to that tradition of conflict 
within political circles as well as intelligence agencies between those different segments and uh, um, those guys with the predecessors of the of their you know of of their contempt of the contemporary counterparts uh and essentially generations of officers and generations of politicians kind of continued from where it was started and probably if we examine records close enough it would be fair to say we would see how even some of their terrorist counterparts you know as time changed nevertheless maintained uh, some sort of a almost familial relationship with um, with some of these subjects. There is no sudden shift. We did one thing, uh, then you know everything changed, and then all of a sudden something happened. There is some sort of a kind of there is a continuity there that that bears examination. Would would well, that be fair to say? My my impression is that. Um... Uh, we often speak about a common foreign policy, all right, uh, within NATO, within Italy, uh, I'm sorry, within Europe, but um, I don't think that it's possible, at least not now, because every country has different, uh, not only different interests in the Middle East, North Africa, but also a different history, a different political line. Now, um, if um, if they throughout the years they have been following a specific political and intelligence line based on um, relations that were strengthened through time. It's kind of hard, or not, it's not hard because, you know, I mean, if there is the need, you do change lines, but there is no will to actually change. Um, Italy uh, has always uh, had some sort of uh, um, Arab oriented uh, policy, and I am saying Arab oriented, and I know that. Nowadays, it doesn't make sense because I'm still referring to the 70s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Today, the thing is, the situation is far more complicated. Uh, we know that there are terror groups that are backed by specific countries. We know that. We know what uh, we know what Qatar does. We know what Iran does. And yet, some countries. Uh, Italy, for instance, uh, you know, they still want to maintain relations with Iran, with Qatar. They, for economic reasons, of course, I mean, uh, even in Libya, we all know Italy sided with uh, Al Saraj, and it wasn't because Italy liked Saraj because his personality it was because of economic reasons because of uh, um, a lot of other um, elements. But, I think there is a but, uh, if, if, we, if we know that there are certain relations that are problematic for the fight against terrorism, then we need to be pragmatic about that uh, it's it's just uh, i don't i don't see any other uh, any other way um i don't i don't know if um regard look uh, let me give you an example egypt okay egypt al sisi okay when uh, uh, Morsi was um, was taken down, Milan, Italy, Milan in particular, became the uh, the European capital of their assistance against Al Sisi. I'm not saying that uh, pro Morsi um, activists were saying that. Um, we had 
the we, we, we had a lot of uh, activism against uh, um, you know economic deals between uh, Italy and Egypt and I think further det deteriorated with the Regeni case um, in many cases they pointed the finger against Egypt but I didn't see anyone uh, um, proper to um, going properly and look uh, for instance at Cambridge in the UK I mean but, but that's another story. Um, so it's it's not anymore about who uh, you know they, they siding with the Arab world. It's a matter of siding with the specific sectors of the Arab world. Okay, because we all know that, for instance, the Emirates, Bahrain, uh, um, Saudi Arabia, um, they have blacklisted the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they, they, we know that. Uh, so uh, that's an important step. Um, we've seen what happened with Hamas in the UK recently. Uh, so we should, you know, we should start to seriously ponder about this and be pragmatic because to me, it, it, it doesn't make any sense to say, yeah, we want to, um, we, we want to contrast uh, uh, jihadism and uh, uh, Islamist extremism, but then we, you know, we go and make deals with the wrong people. We we have uh, um, we have Islamists uh, just uh, going through the through through the country. We have uh, uh, we have all kind of strange situation that that's just not possible. Um, I just see it that way. I want to ask you a couple of questions related to uh, Dr. Velfo's framing and because a lot of it really was tying into what you were saying. And I have a couple of questions, one mm -hmm. kind of broader and one kind of specifically related to the Omri case. The broader question is he mentioned the division between state and non-state actors. Now, if you look at the events taking place in the 70s and the 80s, we saw the PFLP, a non-state actor, but it was backed by the Soviet Union, a state actor at the time. And you also had this radical leftist shells that were sort of backed by the Soviet Union, but were also kind of independent actors with their own uh, specific uh, local ideologies that were kind of basically fellow travelers. Um, and then we are seeing, then we, we see a shift into uh, you know, various terrorist groups, militias, ISIS, you know, Al-Qaeda, non-state actors, which are very comfortable doing deals with state actors. Al-Qaeda getting cover from Iran, being having specific ties into specific members of various countries, royal families, but not necessarily with the government apparatus as a whole, but specific relationships within uh, those sectors. Uh, uh, we see different other proxy groups, we see funding from state actors. Hamas, for instance, late, uh, appeared much later, Muslim Brotherhood, completely a non-state group, which nevertheless now is receiving assistance from Iran. So how, uh, you know, given this complexity and given the difficulty now in distinguishing between state and non-state actors and the measures that can be done to confront them, how, how does that fit into the into what you've seen from that narrative from the 70s to the contemporary days in Italy's uh, maneuver with all these actors? Well, I think that um, there, is, there is an important um, aspect that we should consider. Uh, at the time of the Soviet Union, we had all this uh, uh, Palestinian uh, um, left-wing uh, pseudo-nationalist groups, okay? They weren't Islamists. And they were backed by, uh, by the Soviets. Um, so uh, at that time, the West uh, needed um, something to contrast this ideology. Um, and that's, I think, uh, where... Um, a key element is because the Muslim Brotherhood for a long time was used by the West against 
the pan-Arabism and left-wing ideology within the Arab world, okay? Uh, PFLP, PFLP, GC, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, as the um, Afghanistan, we know, like, uh, you know, the Mujahideen uh, against the Soviet, I think that with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, the situation became far more complicated because we had all these Islamist groups and jihadist groups that began to spread and not just in the Muslim world, but in Europe, in the UK. Um, we've seen what happened in the 90s in Algeria. Um, we've seen what happened with international jihadism. All these organizations that started popping up. I mean, we've seen uh, jihadists, like for um, Afghans of the uh, veterans of the uh, Soviet Afghan war, going back to Algeria, then going to Bosnia to fight uh, against the Serbs and the Croats. And then we've seen them in Chechnya. Uh, in Chechnya, we've seen a lot of strange things. Uh, we've seen uh, um, jihadi, uh, jihadi, let's call them jihadi salat. I, I don't really like the term, but just to uh, um, to use one um, over there, they call them Wahhabis. But anyway, these guys uh, they, 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 that were fighting against the Russians at the same time, they were fighting against the local Muslims, the Sufis in the Caucasus. Um, we've seen. Um, for instance, we've seen what happened in Egypt, we've seen uh, what happened uh, all over the place. And uh, it, it's hard because um, each, um, each area, each um, country has its own uh, peculiarities, its own characteristics. So it's not always easy to find the proper way to contrast them and I would say to prevent them. Um, I like prevention, I like to prevent. Uh, so as to Italy, um, I believe that part of the reason why some within the political and the intelligence community are still keen to uh, speak to the Islamists, to the Muslim Brotherhood, is because this they must have in some way, um, uh, they, 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 they must still feel that heritage of uh, using them against, I don't know who, because, you know, the Soviet Union is not there anymore. So it doesn't make sense to me. Um, in one case, I remember being told uh, do you know who is uh, the biggest uh, country that sponsors Hamas? I'm talking about, this was, I think, in early 2014, if I recall correctly. And, well, Iran, for instance, uh, we know Qatar. Huh? No, Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about the intelligence community here. I was like, Saudi Arabia? Okay, that doesn't... Right. It, it, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound right to me no because officially hamas is listed as a terrorist organization in saudi arabia exactly so... exactly exactly but i this was during the egyptian turmoil more mm -hmm. as you see so i interpreted this as a way to you know discredit those who were supporting al -Sisi. That's how, this is my own interpretation, okay? And um, oh, again- How could it be that the Saudi intelligence is suffering from the same problem as, as what you just described in Italy and what is likely, very likely the case with the United States and frankly, every country on planet Earth having those internal inter intelligence sectors, especially given the fact that Saudi Arabia has gone through a political transition, but which ne ne did not necessarily transmit to the complete transition 
on intelligence. You can't just fire everybody and hire a whole new host of new people with a new mindset the moment you, you know, you take power, especially if you don't have complete power to begin with. So then, you know, one can only surmise that there is a mixture of approaches, ideologies, and... Um, yeah, th th that's the thing. I mean, there is no main line that is being followed. There are sectors that sometimes, you know, belonging to the same apparatus that work against each other. And that is a problem because, uh, and here it's even worse because, you know, there's also a political um, line that is not clear. I mean, think about, uh, think about Salvini. I mean, before he, he, you know, he speaks against Qatar because they finance terrorism and they're extremists. And then when he goes to power, he, ch he totally changes, he drastically changes his mind. I mean, this is this is schizophrenic. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that Salvini is schizophrenic. I mean, uh, this attitude is schizophrenic. Um, sure. It's it, it, it's contradicting. I mean, if you it's say something, corruption. Let, 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 let's just put it out there. It's just obvious corruption. You know, it's it yeah. can't be that he suddenly decided that well, Qatar is could be helpful on some things in. You know, when it's very obvious where the flow of funding is going and it's going to keep these attitudes in place. And quite frankly, if you have, you know, groups that are benefiting financially, of course, they'll have an incentive to keep talking to the terrorists if they feel they can get something out of it. Of course. Of the course. incentive system that incentivizes particular approaches, whether in intelligence, in politics or in any, any structure. You know, if you, you know, if you incentivize one approach, it will keep maintaining itself. If you, if it ceases to have incentives, then it will diminish at the very least if it doesn't disappear completely. So the continuous flow of funding and political support, no doubt, plays its role. For a second, I wanted to shift to a more specific case scenario, which is the Amri case and um, that whole system of study group cells. Now you mentioned the peculiarities in that particular case related to Germany and so forth. And you, you also mentioned the extensive network this individual possessed. Um, first of all, I'm kind of curious what happened as a result of investigations of that network? And second, have any of them been traced to his prison, early prison days when he was radicalized? Were any members of that network members of a, a particular study group that he may have had? Not that I'm aware of. All I know is that, um... This individuals, um, they they hadn't even placed under custody. They were they were free. They were just being investigated. I I think that two or three were actually arrested, but I don't know what happened afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. And regarding um, regarding Sicily, uh, it's uh, I am not aware of any any follow up on, but. Uh, it's, I remember that initially they were trying to say that he had radicalized in Germany because, you know, they didn't want any responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, then it was hard to back that up because there were so many warnings and notices about Amri's uh, behavior in while uh, detained in, uh, in various... Uh, Sicilian structures that it just it just made it just it, it just absolutely made no sense. A lot of people are still wondering why and how Amri got uh, managed to get the uh, the contact of Abu Wala in Germany because Abu Wala was a very paranoid and suspicious individual. So one of the the hypothesis is that um, someone in Sicily managed to um, hook him up. He got hooked up somehow with Abu Wala's um, group in Germany. But I, I don't have any uh, clear evidence, and I don't know if anyone does actually but it, it's it's very yeah 
from what you're telling me, what should have happened, and you know, once you get some potential, even suspicion that some that there may be a link between, you know, one terrorist contacts in one country and a well-known cell in you know in Germany or whichever other country, there should have been a joint investigation into the networks of both groups. Clearly, something is amiss if that did not happen. That often look a lot of times inside one country, uh, one uh, police corp doesn't speak to the other. Intelligence, they're like, everyone is always very, um, uh, there's a lot of hesitation to share intelligence and information with another corp. Why? I don't know. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. So you can imagine between one country and another. Uh, but that doesn't go anywhere. We're not going anywhere if we work in such a way. Uh, remember when I said, you know, uh, there, there's no common uh, foreign policy in Europe, and we know that. But I don't see an effort in, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in terror investigations either. I mean, I'm not saying that they don't share information, but I'm saying that they don't do enough. That's what I'm saying. I mean, if, look, if a terrorist is able to reach the Italian coasts illegally, and, that, and we, there would be a lot to say about that, because I remember years ago, not too long ago, when uh, there was this mantra that terrorists didn't come illegally, uh, and that absolutely made no sense, and evidence proved, proved it. But, I mean, if a terrorist is able to be identified, and just let go with a paper saying you have to leave in a, I can't remember, in a specific number of days. And then they just, you know, uh, because we didn't know he was, uh, he was, he was dangerous. Uh, he wasn't radicalized. He wasn't radicalized. You didn't know that he wasn't radicalized because it, it was proved that I saw we had radical was already a radical in Tunisia so the fact that you didn't know it means that something didn't work and I'm not saying that it's the Italians fault I'm saying that maybe the Tunisians didn't tell the Italians why didn't they Tunisian of course uh, you know what, what do countries tend to do you know just it's better if they leave because if they stay here they will create issues here so it's better if they go abroad I'm not saying that it, it happens and it happens everywhere, but it is not possible that we have terrorists that just simply transit through the territory and, you know, they manage to go and perpetrate attacks. That's just not acceptable. And uh, I mean, we have, uh, in the West, we have the tools to prevent this. It's just a matter of will in my point of view. And now, one, one thing that I wanted to note is the change in methods from the 70s and 80s to the contemporary times. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the, you know, you had these large scale events, uh, terrorist, you know, train stations, synagogues uh, being blown up, hijackings of airlines and whatever. On the one hand, security has changed since then video cameras and so forth have made Absolutely. you know some of these things more difficult to plan but on the other hand i would also venture that especially in the past few years some of these terrorist groups have appeared taken a break from planning of large-scale events and focused more on the political ideological spread that essentially brings their supporters of their ideological views to political power in the u.s it's certainly the case yes well, uh, we have seen um, two um, interesting changes. First of all, um, on a practical level, on an operative level, uh, now everything is far more protected. You know, we, when we talk about hard targets and soft targets, hard targets are hard to attack. So synagogues are protected. Uh, institutional um, buildings are protected. 
it's far harder. We have a lot of uh, technology that is used to, uh, you know, for prevention. Um, I must say that a lot of times uh, we tend to um, refer a bit too much on technology, and we're use, we're losing the human the human intelligence part, which is very 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 important. Um, but as you as you correctly st stated, yes, uh, a lot of um, uh, you know in a lot of cases we have seen this infiltration of uh, um, extremist Islamist extremist groups. Um, some now they're called political Islam, but we know what we're dealing with. We, we know what we're talking about. That are trying to infiltrate. Uh, the political environment and the institutional environment in some cases uh, because they they have a different strategy they uh, their objective is to rather infiltrate the system and change it from within and that is very that is a very dangerous strategy that's that's a very dangerous phenomenon um we we have seen it uh, we've seen it in america we've seen it in the uk we've seen it in europe um and uh, that um it, it's not it, it's not a short-term strategy this is a long-term strategy but if we're not careful it is all, it is a very effective strategy I have to say one prime example of it is not in the US, not in Europe, which I could speak, you know, until the end of the day, but Israel, where the current governing coalition, uh, you know, elected a group of leftist parties, a group of Islam, an Islamist party, and quite recently the Knesset voted down a bill that would expel families of terrorists from the country. So if Israel is taking this political approach, what can be said? From, for other countries, uh, you know, if you can get elected as an Islamist in Israel, <laughs> I know you, you know, and you can keep those very extremists that are causing constant problems politically, legally, you know, in in power, then you've already won. Absolutely. Then the the the, the thing is that um, it's something that. Uh, I mean, we, we knew about this. It's not like it, it didn't come out of the blue. We knew about it. We knew what they were doing. I mean, um, they, I've, I've, I've seen that on plenty of occasions. You know, the warnings were uh, were coming. Um, articles were being published. Uh, every things were being exposed, but. If there is no political will to stop this, it will not be stopped. Okay, I remember. Look, um, a, uh, a few years back uh, in Milan, uh, there was uh, you know the the, um, the PD. The PD was uh, the basically the, the, the we refer to the PD as the Troy horse of the Muslim Brotherhood of political Islam. They um, nominated a uh, a woman that um, for um, um, for the city council of Milan. I mean, um, and she she has uh, uh, she doesn't have any issues. But for instance, um, newspaper Il Giornale exposed how she uh, how her mom was posting uh, pro Hamas. Uh, posts on Facebook, and this created, you know, some embarrassment uh, among the political uh, uh, arena. Now, okay, it was her mom. It wasn't her. Okay, uh, no doubt about that. But still, this, you know, gives this gives you an idea of what type of ideology is still going on among certain um, environments. And, and this, is, this isn't even the worst, because if, 
if you, if you go to um, let's say Rome Centocelle or uh, Torino Porta Palazzo or wherever, uh, you know, in uh, illegal prayer rooms, you can hear my, you know, you can work, you can hear anything, and and this is being tolerated. Okay, it's true. Italy also has a policy of expelling those who are considered a uh, danger for um, national security. They're deported. They're simply, they're kicked out. And and that, I mean, uh, I, I say a lot of bad things about Italian uh, um, uh, policies in relation to <laughs> Islamism, but I, I must also, uh, you know, uh, uh, underline the, the things that do work and this, even though some human rights um, organizations have uh, raised questions about this, uh, still, you know, that, that probably did, uh, did help in uh, um, maintaining security. I mean, partially, uh, but still, there are a lot of, um, uh, of radical groups, radical, uh, individuals that are freely operating and uh, you know if at some point they figure out the way to infiltrate the system then we will have we will have a problem and again this is far more dangerous than uh, the short-term uh, jihadist uh, strategy because at the end of the day, terrorism is just one way of achieving a goal. If it doesn't work, or if there are better ways that come around, uh, the extremists will simply shift to from one thing to another. At, and at least temporarily, uh, the society will grow complacent. The resources will be reallocated from fighting the disruption of attacks to something else. And once there is no longer the need for it, then they can come straight back to to that simply having outweighed you know the 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 society which cannot perpetually keep up you know a host of counterterrorism experts when there are other needs if there's nothing you know happening for a while absolutely absolutely so, so we are seeing that and uh, you know i wanted to kind of end on a uh, you know <laughs> i'm sorry to take so much of your time i wanted to oh, end okay. with the final question concerning coming back to the 1982 scenario, the fact that you underscored that no one uh, suffered consequences as a result of this. Uh, uh, there's been no accountability. 40 years later, the files have been declassified. And what now? What, how do you give closure to the survivors, to their families, when you know that the government has covered up, has allowed this to happen, nothing ever happened, similar things are likely to happen because there's been no official um, repercussions of any kind for anyone. Who do you hold, hold accountable now? What can you, when, what is there to be done after 40 years? Well, um, one thing's for sure. Uh, I think that the, the Jewish community has the right to have all their questions uh, all its questions answered because it doesn't matter if it, it took place 40 years ago. I mean, it's, um, it's, I don't know what can be done to go after the perpetrator and the, the one who organized it because I don't even know if they're still alive. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I don't know. Uh, if they're still, you know, if they're still alive, I mean, then something should be done. But you know the families of the of the victims, the the community. I mean, the, the community at the time had raised concerns on several occasions, and uh, you know, they just, no measure was taken. Now they have a right to um, to know the whole story, to know what happened, to know why nothing was done to prevent, to know why. Um, the uh, despite the fact that you know 16 warnings had been made by the Italian intelligence to the 
to the government and to the police, nothing was done. They, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's unacceptable that in a democratic country, or at least what should be a democratic country, uh, you know, the, 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 the victims, the relative of the victims don't have the right to, to justice and to information. This is the, 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 the least that the, uh, the institutions can do is provide uh, full, uh, full, full clarity on what happened. Absolutely. And, and that's the least. That's the least. Of course, the question always remains, what are the mechanisms in place now to prevent the repetition of these chains of events? And judging by what you said, there may not be any, given that there is a continuity of potential behind the scenes deal making. There is hard target you know, prevention kind of counter-terrorism strategy, but in terms of political context, I'm not sure that if much has changed. No, politically, I don't think that uh, much has changed. Um, it's, it's, I guess it's, uh, it's obvious. I mean, all you have, all you really have to do is look at the foreign policy. Um, who, there, you know, tell me who you go with, and you will, and that will tell you who you are. Um, I think that. <laughs> that that is a that's a sufficient explanation. Uh, mechanisms are still. I I I believe that they are still in some way in place. Um, not the same ones, but something sim similar. Similar. Um, again, we have, you know, now today we have technology. We have more means to. Uh, protect certain targets. Uh, in the seventies, the situation was very different. But if you have, if you get sixteen warnings, I mean, you don't remove the patrol car on the day of a bar mitzvah, or you know, you you just don't do that. You place two. If you don't have two, you place one, and you place more men. Uh, it's I, I, that's that's very basic, okay? That's very basic. Um, it's uh, it, it's pretty much a political issue, more than a security uh, one. So at the end of the day, what we need to figure out is a way how to address uh, these issues on ideological, political level, because at the end of the day, security is in the hands of decision makers exactly and, you know you can have all the methods in the world but if you don't apply them you know what would are they now this intelligent been, response to politics this has been the most fascinating and enlightening conversation and i hope you actually end up writing <laughs> writing a book on this because frankly there's a lack of english language resources about european uh, security issues and I think we could all benefit from sharing um, and discussing these points, these cases that you highlighted. There's almost nothing. I, one of the biggest problems that emerged from our discussion is this lack of cooperation. But while we cannot control intelligence agencies, academic research, public research cooperation between private parties studying these issues, that's something uh, we can uh, do something about that. At least if you could reference the books that you mentioned in your own work. Yeah, in English, I will do that. That, that would be something that uh, that uh, people all over the world could benefit from and understand and contribute and uh, facilitate collaboration efforts. So it is, I'm hoping it is to my see... intention to write about it too. Yes. I hope so. I, I, I That is something that I want to read for all the, all the juicy details that didn't I uh, couldn't make it into one conversation. And thank you so much again. <laughs> thank uh, you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be sharing the video afterwards. Best of luck with <coughs> with, with everything. And uh, I look forward to, to future, future discussions. I'm sure there'll be many.
looking forward to that. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you.